share the screen. Welcome all to episode six, uh, last in series one of the Princeton Makers Book Club. It's been a uh, really enjoyable experience and I appreciate all of you coming and tuning in. And for me, uh, the guests have been, it's been a lot of fun on the front end because I get to have all these conversations before we have this conversation, which is great to get to catch up with people, especially since we don't get to see very many of each other right now. Um, so the book club for me has been a really great way to get some people together and get them out towards you. So by all means, if you have questions this evening, go ahead and put them in the chat, but we will go ahead and get started. And as, as I do with each of these episodes, I kind of have a, a theme that I center everything around. And, and I thought it would be a good time to bring in the concept of intuition, which I think those that, are, that make art, or make prints, it's a, it's a really base descriptor for how we go about making a lot of decisions. It's, it's that thing that you just know, and it's subconscious in so many ways. And so much of it from the printer's perspective comes from experience or time on the press. And I like to start off with an image like this because this, this print of Bob Blackburn's faux pas, there's the trial proof on the left, which is an earlier version of the final state on the right. And there's so many small details that are in this print that you miss if you don't spend that much time. And I think it really kind of describes that artist's intuition visually really well. You know, there's the big color differences, like you can see the red versus the black um, changes in the two different areas. But then there's these subtle things that happen throughout where um, like if you look down the middle of the print, the one on the left, there's these black chunks that kind of come out into that, that stripe zone. And on the one on the right, the stripe has been, it's been made a white line and a darker black vertical line on the right is now lightened. And you start to see how he's using the drawing painting process of print to move an image around, to make things pop out and push things back, changes of color. And so this to me is like the visual personification of the result of an artist's intuition and something that you can sit and stare at for long periods of time. I was fortunate enough when I was the director of Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop to have faux pas hanging in my office. So I could see it every day. And it was one of those things that to this day, I still don't know how many runs there were on the final print, how many layers of color and exactly how it was put together. It'd be the thing that I would get distracted by and realize I still have no idea how Bob did this. And to me, that's one of the greatest things about that creative process, especially what Bob had pioneered in lithography is that it doesn't ultimately matter how it was made, it matters why you made it and what you made and how you want to share it. And I think Bob really always captivated people with his work in that way. This to me is intuition from the outside looking in. So when I look at James Sienna on, on the left and Katia Santabani on the right, that's, uh, that's what other people see when you're in the middle of your intuition process. And here they are um, at Shore Publishing doing a project in collaboration with May Shore, our guest later this evening working on a pair of prints called Forehand Choker and Jawbreaker Six Play. And these were collaborative reduction woodcuts, meaning one would cut a block and the other one would cut a different block. The person who cut would pick the color for the other person's cut and they would swap those blocks back and forth. It's a kind of crazy process when you think about it because you only have control over one element of each layer that's done. So you cut it, but you don't pick the color. And then they were doing this um, blind, meaning they didn't know what the other person was cutting. So the day in the shop, everything was being revealed. And this gives you kind of an idea of what it looks like when they go back in and make adjustments to the blocks during proofing and just kind of how beautiful the object of the wood blocks themselves become after each successive layer of printing. So this is James cutting one of the blocks. And here is the final two images. And so for me, you know, this is a project that's, uh, requires a great level of intuition as well as faith that it's going to work and it's something we'll talk to may uh, about more later on in the program but um, as i was talking to chris and may as we were getting set up this is a pair of prints there's a few images every now and again that as a printer you wished you would have printed and this is a pair that i wished i would have printed the minute i saw them for the first time i was blown away by them i've always loved these and was really happy to include them in the book and we'll get to talk to may a little bit more about the process of making these with james and katya this, for a lot of ways, I like showing this image when I think about intuition of Chakai Booker making her work because it is all intuitive, her work. And when you talk to her about it, 
she talks a great deal about the rhythm and the flow and the movement of pieces and how she moves the eye throughout a picture plane and in and out. And the terms that she's always using to describe her print works is the same terminology she uses to describe her sculpture. And the physicality of the process for her is a really important part in kind of the ways in which she thinks. She thinks a great deal with her hands and that process of doing. And so for her, you could ask her, you know, what, what's, what's with this particular mark that's being repeated? And she'll just say, that's just the way it has to be, you know? And for me, she's always describing that level of intuition. She's someone who is almost hundred percent in an intuitive state when she's in the world in general. And so here's two images, you know, that were from the book. The one on the left was uh, done at Flying Horse Editions down in Orlando. And that's a screen print on fabric combination. You know, and there's, for me, it was really fun to get to bring fabric into her Chinkoy process because that's really where she started off as an artist was working in textiles and wearable art. And so it was nice to be able to bring her way of working traditionally, like she had done in Shinkoi, like the image on the right that was printed at the Robert Blackburn printmaking workshop um, with Justin Sands, which is layers of paper. But in this case, you get a very similar visual output, but it has a very tactile, tactically different feel because of the material shift. And I like to show this one too, because this project, um, Sarah Sanders, when you see these little chairs and they're small, it's that one right there behind me. It's, that's its scale, you know? So in the book, it's almost exact size. It's almost exact scale. Um, for her, she starts off doing a drawing of a chair that is exact, the appropriate perspective, has all the wheels or all the legs on it. And then she starts to warp it in the way that you think a chair should be. Like it's your mind's eye version of a chair because if you actually look at a chair in that dead on position, it doesn't look like a chair. It's, it's kind of too accurate. And so she spends all this time making these line drawings just to warp it. So if you're looking down on certain parts, you're looking straight at other parts, other parts you kind of have an angle shot, but she combines them all into one. And she does all this, it's just a line drawing, a simple line drawing, so no color. And when she goes to make it then, it's a total intuitive process on how each layer has to be drawn to build up to make that final image. So what you're looking at in the top left in the black and the top left in the yellow, that's where she started. Then you're working left to right, top to bottom. So that's each drawing she had to do and each layer as it builds on to start to create this object that is this chair. And so it requires, you know, a lot of patience and a willingness to watch something grow. And these projects are done as what we refer to as print as you go. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with some of um, May's projects uh, later, which means you don't have a set number of things that are already pre-prepared. You're having to print, make adjustments, print again, make adjustments, print, make adjustments, and then it builds towards its final um, rather than a whole bunch of parts that you can put together, reproof, make adjustments to those, put them back together and leave things in or out. If you make a mistake, you're kind of, you have, you have to start all over or scrap the project. So in this case, that it's really important for an artist to be able to trust their own intuition and to trust their own mark making and to trust their drawing skills moving forward. And I wanted to show a little bit more of this project and talk a little bit more about a different side of it that was in the book as well, because it really fits into that intuition aspect. This is a project that Kate Shepard has been working on with mass printer Luther Davis since 2009. It's a suite of what we call monoprints because she's, so it's not about additioning these. It's about taking a set format um, and a plan and printing color making 180 degree rotation of screens or a slight shift of the blocks that she's using, the color blocks and altering the colors over time. And so what you see in the, in the rack is Luther and Kate working out like color. And this is the thing that they go back and forth on a great deal. It's like the minutia of color. Like it needs to be 2% more yellow or knock just a tiny bit of green out of that. And it's like to most people when they look at it, they're like, what are you really looking at? But for Kate, what it's about is not just the big fields of color, but the little tiny edges that you get. And so for her, she's like, this is what you get when you take Joseph Alvarez's work and you make it slightly off register. And it's that slight bit of off register. It's those little areas of overlap and peeking out that really get her excited creatively and as well as dealing with color as a project. And so for her, this is, you know, two different prints and they're a few years apart um, out of this ongoing series. It's, it's really about how she can utilize color and transparency as well as opacity. And if you follow Kate on Instagram, you'll see that she is what I've been waiting for. She's finally gone to black and white, 
which is really still full color, but it looks like it's just grayscale, which is one of the most difficult things to actually pull off to make that color feel in a grayscale format feel just as vibrant as these color pieces when you set them next to each other. And she's really pulling it off. It's that one of the hardest things you can possibly do in a series of work like this. So if you don't, if you follow Kate Shepard at all, you'll start to see that she's doing that. But this is a project that, you know, for Kate, where she's at right now, if you talk to her about the color selection and the placement, she's going to be speaking to you and those and that language of intuition. She'll be saying, well, this just has to peek out a little bit more. And you'll be like, why? And she'll say, because I need that, I need you to feel that color more. Or she'll say, it needs a little bit less because I need you to know it's there, but not really see it. And, you know, so she's just really working in, in a lot of that language. And, and I kind of bring this up for you guys, uh, who, for those of you who aren't printers, a lot of the conversation that we have with the artists that we're working with is in this area that if you were to take a transcript of what it is that we say to an artist and what an artist says to us, you would probably absolutely have no idea what's being said. And you'd be like, what do you mean by that? And we'll be like, because they'll be like, you know, when the line does the, the thing and, it, and it's over there and, and we're like, oh yes, I know exactly what you mean. And really it's this complete language of hand gestures. I mean, I'm Italian, so it's, it's even wilder hand gestures and, and the ways in which we have this dialogue because we, we are have to lock into one another's intuition in order to get these things to move forward. And so if, if I encourage you guys when you are looking at work to use your gut and your intuition as well, because it's not just in the making part of the process that intuition is so important. It's also in the viewing side of it. It's when you have that gut response, I should walk across the room and go take a look at that. You should definitely walk across the room and go take a look at that. Or one of my, one of my favorite things is when a piece physically moves you you know, where you walk up to it and the way that something about it actually makes you move yourself in space or make draws you into something closer. And, and so trust your gut in that part of the process because the artist is, has done so much to create an environment for you as a viewer to make you a part of their world, like to really let you into the way that they see the world. So the viewer's intuition is just as important as the artist or the printer's or the publisher's intuition in that case. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first guest, Chris Grundon. I met Chris a number of years ago. I was trying to remember exactly when. It's at least a decade ago. Um, and what I immediately resonated with Chris about was I ran into another print geek, someone who loved prints just as much as I did. And he would see things in prints that I never saw. And it was really always great to have conversations with Chris. And then I got to know him and I found out a little bit more about the rest of his life outside of just being a print lover like the rest of us and is that um, he's been a content sourcer for HBO for over 30 years so if you've seen an independent film on HBO it's likely Chris found it and got it into the a place on HBO for you to see he's also been one of the people in charge of getting HBO Max launched during a pandemic and you know so his the natural working state is someone who can't let things get away that's like his job and so I would thought it'd be really fun to talk about the things that have gotten away and his perspective on his collecting and his collecting habits because I think he's got a lot of really great healthy collecting habits so the two prints that uh, Chris and I had talked about um, talking about tonight because we were like well what's the one that got away and he's like well there was this one and there was this one and he started we, I was like well we gotta do we can just do more than one and so the first was this print by Carol Dunham and it was uh, published by Two Palms. And I remember, <clears throat> I remember this print too when it first came out and it was one that I always loved and Chris will go into a little bit more about that. And then there's this one here by Colby Bird that was published by CRG Gallery and was actually printed by Luther Davis when he was at XL, um, Fine Art XL Editions. And this is another one of those few prints out there that one, I wish I owned and two, I wish I printed because I just loved this particular one. And so Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit um, about uh, the first print and maybe some of your collecting and your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Phil. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I don't know when you and I first met, but you know, there was a real, there is and uh, was then and remains today a real community here, I guess, in New York of print fanatics. And uh, some of those folks are artists and printers or both or what what have you, or just enthusiasts like me, you know, but that's, that's, that's how we got started. So, yeah, so the one that got away, I mean, I, I tell you, you're talking about H, I really, until lately, and you and I spoke the other day, and now that I've um, been at HBO, 
as you say, 30 years. I'm kind of in charge of the film acquisition team for major studios and, and uh, independent film. More than ever, I'm, I'm, I'm more sort of, you know, air traffic control directing the process. But um, I, you know, there are films that um, get away that I, you know, we, we just can't uh, get over. And one of them this year, I'll be quite frank, is the uh, Academy Award winner for Best Foreign Film, Another Round, the Thomas Vinterberg film, a terrific movie. And when we had the chance to buy that film, just like a piece of art, it, it just wasn't the right moment. We couldn't quite get the stars to align. And, um, you know, our foreign films, we buy a lot of Spanish language films, but other foreign language films, not as much. So it's always a bit different. Long story short, you know, it goes on to win the Oscar after we passed on that film. So that that's so analogous to what we're talking about here. And th that keeps me awake at night for years, that kind of thing. But it's okay. There's always another movie, just like there's always another print, hopefully, you know, that you're excited about. And it's all about the excitement. You know, my excitement for film and art, that's kind of the, the crossover is how I sell myself and my clients and my art dealing. So yeah, the Carol Dunham print. Um, again, you know, with prints, I mean, it, 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 for some reason, it hasn't happened to me so much. And I collect, I've been collecting, you know, painting and photography and and uh, drawings as well, you know, alongside probably in equal doses. But those prints that are available, why the consideration time, such as it is with addition of 12, 20, 30, you know there's a limit on that. And and when you feel that excitement, you let it pass and the print's gone. I don't know, for some reason, I find it exceptionally maddening. And when I saw the Dunham print the first time, I thought that's very cool. And there was another suite of prints he did at the same time at Two Palms called Waiting for Wood in three different colors. Also, you know, maybe edition 12 or very limited, right? Um, and then, so I said, okay, I didn't, I didn't get any of the above. And then later on at another dealer who's a print publisher, but also a secondary dealer, lo and behold, had pink and blue. There it was in front of me. And that was the first time actually I'd seen it in person. They unwrapped it for me. I could see that wood grain. The price was right. Everything was perfect. It was, you know, not an A, it was the numbered edition. It was right there. And uh, I went home and I, 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 you know, I didn't buy it. Here we are today. But I kept looking at it on the website. And then the day it was gone was... It was a terrible day, right? So that's how I felt about that one. Um, but that's that, you know, that that's that's part of the fun. Um, anyway, I, you know, um, that one may come back around. It seems like so there might be another way to see. Is it just is it still number one on your list or not? That's an interesting question. Many years later, right, for these prints. So, and that was a question that you and I had talked about. Was you know when we, what I thought was really great when you were you were telling me like, oh, this is one of the ones I missed. You're like. Well, I'm thinking about it right now. I have to think about it. is it still number one on my list? The ones that got away, and you know, you, we could all see that you're still really thinking about it. You're still really torn. You know, yeah, the, Col you know, the Colby Bird is a little different case. I mean, it's you know, it's so unfortunate because I guess that print was a uh, victim of Hurricane Sandy, right? In terms of the availability right. of that print, but that's a much bigger edition, right? It's three times the size, and I didn't feel the same urgency. But when you look at that print, you see the New York Times uh, newspaper in the background. Um, HBO is one of the articles, there's an article on some HBO, I forget what it is even. And I said to myself, you, you didn't, why could you, how could you not have bought this? You go into work at HBO every day for 30 years and you don't own Colby's print, which you know is great. But, and it was just one of those things, whatever the reason was, I couldn't afford it at the time. I couldn't get my act together. There's always a reason. And it's not usually because, oh, I've got the money and I don't want to spend it on that. There's, it's usually some other reason, frankly, you know what I mean? Uh, right. But then it was gone, that moment, you know, and, um, that one may come back around again too let's hope so yeah that one's harder because the hurricane sandy and for those of you who don't know i mean uh crg gallery was a ground floor gallery when they when they were open in chelsea and they took on i think it was seven feet of water in their space and they lost everything in their flat files so there was a lot of really great additions that had been recently done maybe only a year old that hadn't really gotten a chance to get their light of day and they were lost, they were completely gone. Um, but Johnson lost a whole bunch of work as well. Um, stuff that I had printed for him and over, over a few years period. And it was a really big loss because you're, it, the print was a big addition, but I think Colby's, I think about a third of the edition was lost and Hurricane Sandy was just completely destroyed. I mean, the flat files were underwater. And so when something like that happens, there's that, that reminder that there is some sense of urgency because every time it comes back sure. around, there's that risk. It's going to be way too expensive now. Yeah. But I told you there's another, I told you there's another category of, of these prints for me, which is something, a print that I was obsessed with for, for a few years. And I finally, it was in a museum show and this and that and had everything going for it. I, by a prominent artist, I won't name, 
finally got a chance to buy the print. You know, I was elated. I brought it home and I looked at, I lived it for a while and I said, this is a museum print. You know what I mean? This is a category, like, I just don't know that this is living with this. And so um, I was able to place it somewhere else, you know, for basically what I paid for it. So it was kind of like a transfer out of my collection. And, uh, but it was a very interesting psychological experience because I wanted that print so badly, you know, that I just almost like de idealized it, I suppose you'd say, you know? So, and prints are so idiosyncratic, let's face it. That's the, the beauty of it, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I also appreciate about your way of collecting, too, is a willingness to recognize that maybe because you bought it now, it's not something you need to live with, that maybe it should have another home, and how you really work to make sure it finds the right home. So it's not just about, you know, letting go of something, but it's about um, placing something in a, in a good location as well. You know, it's about getting yeah, it into a place. Right. I mean, I've been an I've been a private art dealer on the side um, of HBO for 15 years now, and I really started this because I was a print collector and I wanted to get folks infected with the idea of printmaking, which I to this day I still am doing actively. But um, yeah, I mean, that's really kind of where my sort of my touch point still is in the print world on a daily basis, I guess. So. Yeah, I mean, do you? Um, I think you you have the first print you ever purchased behind you, right? Right. So that's. <laughs> Sorry, Arlene Sheckett is the artist, right? So, you know, as a sculptor, and now she's showing, she's, I think she just had a major show in Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken. Not she was, yeah. she's at the top gallery, but um, that was um, Dudonet Paper Mill. And what's so interesting about that is, so um, before I collected anything, I went to a painting show, it was, it was Jacqueline Humphreys was the artist, and it was at Green Naftali. And, they, and I said, wow, is that little teeny painting available? And they said, no, that's sold, but, uh, sh you know, Jacqueline made some, Prints, monotypes, really, they were. And go see Betsy Sr., the print, you know, the print yeah. So I, I met Betsy and she showed me those and a lot of other things. And that was what I ended up buying Arlene's. A few years later, I'm at HBO and we had an ga art gallery at the time on one of our floors in the building on 42nd Street. And it was a rotating installation. And there is Mina Takahashi from Dudene Paper Mill installing another from this series. And I said, hey, you know, I own one of the blah, blah. So I ended up being on the board there, blah, 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 blah. You know, so it was all these things. Mine. But yeah, that's my first work of art. The second work of art was in Elizabeth Murray, ULE etching, which I still own today. And I don't know what number three was, but yeah, you know, it's fun to have a, a living, breathing, rotating collection, I guess, to some extent, sure. So It's definitely something I always encourage collectors to do to rehang their house. Um, because one, you find that you have more space than you thought you did. And two, you find that just by not having a work in a place where you're used to seeing it gives you a completely different perspective on it. Again, the lighting conditions change, yeah. the context changes, something that maybe you could only see up close. You can now maybe see it at a distance and, and it's, it changes so much as it, as you live with it in your house and you no longer take the work for granted if you're willing to move it around. I've been doing more of that. In fact, I like seeing works off the wall, like propped up on the shelf or something in different perspectives I'm finding lately for small works is even more fun for some reason, so. Yeah, so I mean, for you, if, uh, because you do help people buy work, um, what's, your, what's your advice to people when they're, when they're looking to buy? Like, like something that you have to remind them maybe of. I know I'm catching off guard here. <laughs> no, I know, no. <laughs> you know, a lot, I mean, many collectors, you know, say um, I'm not really looking to invest in, in art. I just want to, I want to just buy smart pieces, right? And I say, well, if you're working with me, it's by definition, like I'm in the fine art world. So whether it's $100 or $10,000, like there's a value, I think, I hope in, in, in what I'm doing here, that's that's not, it's not decorative, right? It's a little different, but um, I have a lot of enthusiasm. I obviously I try to share that with my client and just sort of what I used to do literally feel years and years ago was I go to their home or apartment with a binder about this thick, of printouts from every print publisher, Two Palms, Shore, ULAE, Gemini, Paulson, every single one, and I'd, they'd flip through and I'd see what they'd react to. And I was like, okay, that's what they like. Figurative, non-figurative, Ellsworth Kelly, whatever the heck it was, right? But I'll tell you the, the challenge of art dealing 101, it never comes down to that. It's like that wall's 30 inches wide. So if you, I like that piece, it's 32 inches wide. I can't do it. That's art dealing. Yeah, <laughs> that's why that's why it's really hard to sell art in San Francisco. They have all these you know I mean? houses with lots of molding, like nothing fits yeah, in in here. Exactly, that really is a truism, though. It really is. It, it unfortunately or fortunately, some people like me. I don't care. I don't even think about where the thing goes. And I have a lot of a lot of people buy like that. But folks generally, you know, they they don't for good reasons. They don't buy like that, right? So yeah, yeah, that's true. So. 
I mean, for me, one of the other things that I've also appreciated about what you do, um, and maybe you could pass that a little bit of that encouragement on, is your focus on emerging artists or, or younger talent. Like you spend a lot of time going to galleries that are representing new artists. So what's, what's your draw for that? And while you're talking about that, I'm going to turn my light on. All right. Yeah. Well, it's... <laughs> That's something that's evolved over time. I mean, first it was so exciting. Well, you know, the first print that ever, I, the first time I ever realized, holy cow, I can own a print. It was by Kiki Smith, who at that time, you know, was pretty established, just probably early nineties. But I realized for under a thousand dollars, it was, I could actually own that Kiki Smith, it blew my mind. So I, at the early days I was buying kind of Elspeth Kelly, Robert Rauschenberg, stuff that was available for gentle prices back then. But um, unlike the film world, in the art world, I really loved the, the emerging artists that I got to buy work from and randomly got to know through knowing, again, through Dudonet and other places, like it just really appealed to me somehow to be able to support them personally in a way in the film world and really never experienced. So gradually I shifted my focus mostly to emerging um, artists. And um, I don't know, there's no real alchemy or mystery to it really. It's just, it's just something that I believe in doing. And I think that um, there's plenty, it's easy to collect Rauschenberg or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I don't need to exactly. lead people to that. So it's, uh, but I'm, I love when I work with that, those things, you know, it's, it's exhilarating for me, but I feel like it's my mission. Just like my mission is with independent filmmakers. I don't need to support Paramount and Fox and who, whomever. I'm like, I, I'm for the indies and I, the art world, I guess, when I think, really think about it, that's what I'm about there too, so. Yeah, because I mean, I've, I mean, I've, I've watched you collect a lot of people at the very beginnings of things beginnings of their careers and you know your gut was always that's good work and that's a good artist and i believe in and them and their vision and where they're wanting to go with their work and i think that's been something that you know i often am trying to help collectors understand to trust their gut in that way and to get involved in that way because it's so much more rewarding i mean i think some of that enthusiasm and energy that comes through in you is because you're an active participant in, in, the, in the art world and in the print world in particular. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a thrill getting in early. I mean, there's a print behind me. I can't know if you can really see it, but it's over my shoulder. It's an Eddie Martinez. I think it's the first print he ever did, edition 25. And I, I paid $120, $150 for it, you know, and right. here we are today. And then now I look at that and I think you didn't buy a painting or a drawing or I sold <laughs> all of the above, I never bought them. I'm, I'm a better um, dealer than I am a collector though. I, th I suspect that's not, I'm not the only one, but that's just something I've also learned for some reason, I don't know why, but. Well, I think you wanna see a lot more. And I think, uh, you know, selling work to other other collectors means you get to see a lot more work and you get to <laughs> maybe go visit it again. <laughs> That's a thrill for me. It was, I, that's why I said from day one, it's vicarious collecting. That's why I do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the best part of it. It's not about the business or anything else. It's vicarious collecting. You know, I, who can buy everything they love? No one. Right, because you, you're buying a warehouse too at that point. It's where you're going to put it all. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I remember working with Eddie in the very, very beginning as well. I did, I did most of, I may have actually printed that one. I did most of all of his early prints for him. And, you know, it was, it was one of those things where, you could just watch, it was like a light switch flipping with the way things were moving. Like nothing was moving and then everything was moving. That's the way it's been ever since. And the nice part, you know, for me as a printer was being able to introduce him to the medium of print early on because he still does it, you know? So I feel yeah, like it's it'll be yeah. a life, it'll be a lifelong uh, pursuit for him as an artist, so. Maybe I'll take two seconds and just bring it over real quick because it's kind of cool to show and then. Yeah, please do. So if you guys are catching anything with this is that um, there can be an addictive quality to print collecting <laughs> and that's a good thing. Oh yeah, I remember that one. I didn't print that one, but yeah, I remember that one. This is, uh, so these are all hand colored, they're edition 25. So like that orange, the yellow hat, that's all hand coloration. And uh, it was at Alexander and Bonin Gallery anyway. Yeah, I don't know who printed it. I really don't know. Yeah, I don't know that one either. Yeah, because I did a set of dry points with him um, that he hand colored a few of the sets, but um, early on and then um, a litho and screen print. And we did a lot of monotypes and things like that together over the years, but he's been a lot of fun to work with over, over a long period of time. It's fun to watch because I, I started working with him before he switched into like full abstraction. And then, you know, again, after he's kind of come back to a halfway point 
And so it was really, it's always a, a pleasure as a printer to be involved in someone's major transition in their work. You, know, yeah. you, get, to be, you get to be, you get to see it. So do you have any parting thoughts uh, for uh, budding collectors or would be collectors out there? You know, the thing, the great thing about working with collectors is it just takes the first purchase, right? First time they're willing to say yes. That could take a year, it could take a month, it could take a week. But um, I would say to do it because I don't, I, I don't think I have a single client who hasn't bought more than one work now at this point. You know what I mean? Like almost everybody says, I can do this. And that is so exciting. And I would say to anybody who hasn't, get get up. And, you know, it doesn't have to be. I, I, I also specialize in very, like the, the lowest possible price point where something's interesting to collect i'm all for it right if i make whatever you know the math it's not about exactly. it's not about it's not about the money it's not the work right so people are like oh if i can buy something for 250 dollars or printed matter a hundred dollars or even 15 dollars which you can actually do that's that's what i would say get out there and start doing it you know so don't worry that you can't afford it you can afford it it's just a matter of what you get so right well thanks chris i'll i always enjoy talking with you and seeing different My things pleasure. and, and uh, always asking what you're looking at because you're always looking at things that I'm not looking at that I probably should be. <laughs> so it's always I, nice to get the perspective. Unfortunately, Phil, on your program tonight, I've seen things now I have to investigate already, which is just the <laughs> part of it, you know. So anyway. it goes. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to feed the addiction. So All right. thanks, thanks. thanks again, Chris. And next up, we've got... Uh, May Shore. I'm going to share my screen with you all. And um, May is someone who's been involved in printmaking for quite some time now. She spent 11 years uh, working at uh, Pace, um, mostly in the paper and relief department, but also in the intaglio department. And over time, she uh, decided to break out on her own and opened uh, Shaymore Gallery up in Tuxedo Park and use that as a means of financing uh, the future of her own print publishing operation. And, you know, for me, what I've always appreciated about the work, and this is her, her gallery there in Tuxedo Park, um, what I've always appreciated about the work that she does is that it feels natural, the work. And one of the reasons that that word intuition came to me um, it was really thinking a great deal about the work that May has done as a printer and publisher and that it's the work never feels forced. It always feels natural. It almost feels like everything has sprung forth fully formed, though it's an unbelievably difficult and laborious process of what she does, but it looks effortless. And I think, you know, if you get a chance to visit her gallery or if you look at her work or see her at an art fair, you'll get that sense of of completeness with the work where it really makes it easy to enter in and engage with it. And, you know, that goes down to the way you hang shows or the artists that you're selecting to work with and how you present their work. And, and so from my perspective, it's always been a really, um, a refreshing, almost oasis to go to, to see the work that you do. And some of the stuff that May and I'll discuss tonight, and I just wanted to give you guys some visuals on are some of the projects she's done with William Villalongo and, when she sent me the images over for this, and I had known about this print, you know, when it came out and had always liked it. And when she sent the images of it, I was, I just had this like deja vu of so many print projects myself. And that you see him working on this beautiful, just like some very simple line drawing. And it's, and there's the colors that are being thought about and like the beginnings of a project. And then you see some blocks being made and there's elements that are coming and going. And then you start saying, okay, we need adjustments. And there's all the notes that have to be made. And when I saw this slide, I was like, I was like, oh yeah, that's the way it goes. <laughs> Here's all the notes. And you can see it's just like every little tiny detail that has to be remembered. It went from being this graceful line drawing into this extraordinarily complicated thing to put together that ends up as a really graceful print. And I think you kind of get that sense of what I was talking about is almost, it seems like it's sprung forth fully formed. It just is what it is. It's, it's what it had to be. But there's all this stuff, this backlog that it takes to bring it into the world. And so the same goes for this print. I remember when I first saw this one, it was one of those things that creeps up on you because you're just so focused on the image. And as a, as a technical person, you know, it actually took me a while to really even think about how she made it. And that's always been my gauge of when a printer has done, like for myself or others, has done their job to the fullest extent is when it's a work of art first that happens to be a print. 
when you don't even really care about the process when you're like oh that's a relief print with some holograph on it and then you're like what's what in this thing and you really start to want to engage with it from a process perspective you know and so this is one of those things where you know it's that division of labor between the artist and the printer and everybody figuring out what they should each be doing and you can so you can see him making some holograph plates and here's the relief blocks and you know some stages of the print so this is what's kind of going down in the beginning to then get that final really luscious black black that's printed on in the end and we'll talk to may here in a minute a little bit more about this process i mean it's as you start to look at it now that you've seen it like in a half printed state you really it really starts to pay attention to those gray cut lines in the in the earlier block that are really wonderful for creating a three-dimensional feel to the object that you don't necessarily notice right away but it's why it seems to move and why it seems to have physical volume um, and it's in its own physical presence something else that i wanted to you know take a little bit of time to talk to may about as well is her support of, of master printers who also make their own work. And this is the work of Yasu Shibata that was, she had exhibited at, at her gallery, Shimor Gallery. And if some of you may be familiar um, with him as a printer, but you're likely, if you're a print geek, familiar with some of the prints he's done, like the insane Yukioi Chuck Close prints, those giant ones that are hundreds of colors, or the Yoshitoma Naras that he did from, and the Yukioi traditional Japanese woodblock style, but he used cardboard blocks for, which is in and of itself just kind of mind boggling because <laughs> Nara wanted that feeling of cardboard. So he used cardboard as a printing matrix. So he is considered to be um, one of the finest practitioners of the process of ukiyo-e. And, but he's also an artist himself. And so one of the things that I've appreciated about what May has done with her programming is also who she supports and how she selects going about that process. So we'll get a chance to talk to her a little bit about that, but I wanted to show you guys some of Yasu's work as well. And I'm gonna reiterate what May had reiterated to me and is that digital version of his prints do them no justice whatsoever. They have a, a glow and a vibration to them based on the how he's printed them, the way the pigments interact with the paper and the processes they will float and kind of undulate when you get in front of them in person. So if you ever get a chance to see these in person, um, I highly, highly encourage you to do it. And something that we'll touch on a little bit too is um, project she's got going, which is kind of round two of the James, Sienna and Katya Satapanya's crazy reduction print process show. Um, and the work that they've been able to kind of get going and, you know, as the pandemic has, has raged on. But I think, to me, this image here on the left of May with James and Katya is really emblematic of our day-to-day -day process. And when I was talking about those conversations that we have that if someone from the outside heard would think are total gibberish, but we're all on the same page, this is what it looks like. You know, like someone looking at a color, someone talking about a color and someone trying to isolate a color like, like looking through or blocking some of it off. And everybody's just kind of in this space where you're trying to use language to help you out, but generally pointing and gesticulation works better. And, you know, so, so without uh, holding back any longer, I wanna bring, go ahead and bring May on um, to talk about some of her process. And the first question I've got for you, May, is you wanna help people understand how you got into the print world to begin with? Hi, thanks so much, Phil. That was a really great, <laughs> great introduction. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I got into the print world probably by sort of by chance, like so many of us, I guess. But um, I, uh, like, where do I, where do I have far back? Do you want me to go? <laughs> or do you want me? I think I think you know it might be helpful for people just to understand you know a little bit of your like art school background and that first introduction because I thought that story you shared with me was really wonderful about your first introduction to collaborative printing. Oh sure, yeah. So I um uh, after I finished school and I studied painting and printmaking in school, I moved to Portland, Oregon. Um, this was the mid '90s, and I met a printer named Mark Mahaffey. And he has a print shop there called Mahaffey Fine Art. And Mark, before he opened up his own studio, was a printer at Gemini. And um, we had met, and then, you know, I, I didn't really know, I was interested in printmaking, of course, but I didn't know that you could be a collaborative printer. 
This wasn't something that I'd ever really even heard of. And um, Mark has this beautiful Victorian house in Portland, um, Northwest Portland. And it's the parlor. He has his litho studio in the basement. He had his uh, letterpress studio. And then upstairs, he lived there with, with his wife, Ray Mahaffey, who's also, uh, she's a painter. And then I think her studio was actually on the top floor. But I'll never forget at the base of the stairs, looking up, so the stair, you know, it was a straight shot staircase that went from the studio to the living, uh, to the, you know, where they live. At the top of the stairs, you could see um, one of Richard Serra's giant Icelandic series prints, intaglio prints that Gemini had published. And I'll never forget standing at the bottom of that staircase and looking up and thinking, wow, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. And this is actually something that you can do that people do. <laughs> and I think from there, I just, I, I realized this is what I want to do. Um, and so I eventually left Oregon and I moved back to New York. I'm from New York. And um, I was introduced to Ruth Lingen. And Ruth, um, the legendary Ruth, she, uh, <laughs> she was the um, director of the relief area and paper making at Pace Editions. It was called Pace Editions back then. This was like 20 years ago. And, um, and so the first project that I, speaking of Dudene actually, um, the first project that I worked on that Ruth brought me in to work on was a uh, checklist paper piece that was being produced at Dudene when they were on Broom Street. And that's actually when, um, when uh, Mina Takahashi was there. And so that was, we were down there in that space and um, started doing that. And then um, was brought in full time after a while and um, really worked under Ruth. You know, Ruth was really, she was my mentor and my very good friend. She's still my very good friend. And um, we have such a close relationship and she's in a way taught me almost everything I feel like I know about printmaking. So she really guided me and, um, mentored me, which was amazing. Yeah, I mean, Ruth is, I think, um, one of those printers who kind of connects to almost everything, you know, mm -hmm. with, um, she, she has a way of um, finding herself in other shops via an artist store because they're like, oh, I want Ruth to come along on this project and she'll you know, find herself out in Oregon or somewhere else. And, um, but always has that kind of base in New York. And there's a lot of, a lot of printers who've got their start working with her and as Definitely. well as with Bill Hall or um, at Pace as well. Cause there's been a lot of, a lot of printers who kind of got their start there. And yes. so for you, you spent about, you said about 11 years, right? Yeah. Working at Pace. Yep. Yep. I was there for 11 years. And then um, I opened this. So this was about 2011. And then I opened up um, the Gal Shamer gallery in tuxedo um, as a way to sell things. That was my primary focus. And then after a few years, I opened up the print shop. So the space became available, coincidentally enough, and then I was able to uh, get a press and, and actually start publishing, which is also what I wanted to do too. So, you know, the two spaces, they're, um, they're adjacent to each other. So they support each other. So, you know, they have different programming and different things are happening in the two spaces but there's a lot of overlap. And um, I often heavily favor uh, shows in the gallery that are print or, or, or print painting collaborative or, you know, I've done a lot of straight print shows. Um, like Yasu did a right. print show and I showed monotypes of Philip Taft. Um, I did a Robert Gober um, show of his editions. Um, Jim Dine, I did a show of his works. And then I also did shows, for example, um, well, like Katia Santabenez, I did a show with her where we showed uh, her paintings, drawings, and prints. And we released an edition for the opening, which was really fun. So that was something that we started to kind of do in the show. Um, but uh, Kevin Francis and Lauren Packarduni, and these are, you know, younger kind of artists that are really working um, in the printed medium, but also have other things that they're interested in. So I kind of always like that balance. Like in the, sh in the gallery right now is a Karen Letterer, who's a painter printmaker, but all her paintings start in the print shop. 
And so how does that um, work for you? When do you try to encourage an artist like that to say, make a monotype or to work towards an etching or a relief print or something along those lines? Um, being that they have that kind of exposure, help people understand a little bit of that conversation process because you're one of those people who is a printer and a publisher. So you're wearing both hats. And so they can kind of get a little bit of how you kind of have to weigh both sides, that full creative potential side versus also the gallery side. Right. The, yeah. And that, that was a new, um, you know, opening a gallery was a new part of that because I'd always just been in the production, never in the sales. So stepping out of that, you know, um, and stepping more into the forefront of the sales part of it was definitely a learning curve, you know, but it's, it's very fluid because it's something that it's, you know, having the spaces next door to each other, it's, it becomes an informative place to have that print shop. And, um, you know, where someone can come into the gallery, they see the show, they see the work, but then you can say, well, you know, this is actually what these images are looking like in the print shop, or this is what these different right. you know, techniques are, and these are what different blocks are. So there's always an edu. I mean, I think I find with prints in general, right? And we had talked about this too. <laughs> exactly. There's a heavy, heavy education part to it where, you know, I think people who don't know what contemporary printmaking is, they think it's a lithograph, you know, or like a courier knives offset lithograph, which we exactly. had so so much of it is just saying, you know, this is actually what a woodcut is and this is how it works and, you know, it's hand printed and, and they get to see the press, which is really nice, which is really fun. And there's so many studios like that have that same model. You know? Yeah, I've always found that if you've got a gallery and a print shop kind of either next door to each other or even in relatively the same space, it's so much easier to help place the work in homes to help sell that work because people have a greater connection to how it's made. They, they understand it. It's that education mm -hmm. aspect. You know, um, my time, I always used to tell people, you know, when I was at UOE, they would say, well, how did you sell most of the work? And I said, well, workshop tours. And yes. they kind of look at it like, what? And I was like, yes, yeah. so if you have a group of collectors who comes into the studio, you walk them through the shop, you show them how you print how you print something and then yep. you take them to the archive room and it's like <laughs> this is like one two three process you know it's like and it's because now that they they have a basis and an understanding and they've had a more hands-on experience i often describe the print shop as this kind of blue collar white collar combination space mm -hmm. because it's you know you're talking about these more intellectual pursuits and things with a lot of the why the art is being made but then there's also this real like get your hands dirty you know, fixing presses and, and helping everybody else. And, and it is that education space. I feel like it's one of those spaces where the artists don't really know what they're doing a lot of the times because they're working in new processes. Printers a lot of times don't know what they're doing because their artists are pushing them to do something they've never done before. Mm -hmm. And then the people who are coming in to look at it don't necessarily know what it's all about. So we're kind of all in the same boat of being okay with not knowing and being willing to learn. And I feel like you know, a lot of what you do with your print shop and your gallery and that combination is that education work. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think the other thing too, by being able to bring a collector or someone who's just interested in art, you know, into the print shop is they actually understand, and this is really important, I think, how involved the artist is. Because I think a lot of times, you know, maybe it's like people may think it's a reproduction or it's some sort of, you know, but that these are original works of art that never existed before. And the artist is, you know, obviously there working on it with the printer and the publisher. And I think that's something that um, I think is really important. Yeah. And I, you know, and for you with your studio being so close to the city, um, you know, being like an hour away from New York city, it's, um, it allows artists to be able to come and go and and make work over time. And so people can see that process kind of drawn out, you know, yes. like, here's where we're at right now at this print. Come back in a month, you'll see where we're at then, you know. Yeah. Whereas some studios where, where if you have the artist has to like, you know, fly in and it's like two weeks, it's like it's all done in two weeks. So unless you show right. up in that two week period, like the magic has come and gone. Right. <laughs> you know? You're doing a lot of Instagram live stories, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully someone, at least an intern's taking photos because it's, I think, 
it's so really important. hard to remember to take pictures you know yeah you and video right i mean video is such a great thing to show the process which is yeah yep i know yeah i was really grateful um when i was uh researching for like what i can include in the book that when i asked you i said do you have any photographs of this and you're like i've got photos and you gave me like way more than i could use it was so great to be able to pick from it because more often than not uh, there was a lot of publishers in the book when i would say do you have photos of like this print being made i'd love to like show more know, and they're like yeah. no and i'm like yeah totally understand like when you're in the middle of making it someone has to remember to stop and take a picture right you have to step out of that flow and grab a camera you know, exactly. and try not to you know, yeah. try not to be intrusive yeah i know it's true it's it's very true i mean it's funny even i think the first five years i was at pace there's not a thing like no one took a photo <laughs> like there's no and we, there wasn't even a photographer who would ever kind of wander into the print shop you know who worked in you know down who'd work on the fifth floor where they would do the photography but um yeah, it's I know it's kind of one of those funny things now, of course, with iPhones, it's so much easier to take. We didn't have iPhones back then, but it's Definitely so much easier now. to take video <laughs> and be kind of inconspicuous, right, where you're not pulling out like a big camera. <laughs> right. There's that wonderful book and I'm failing to remember the name of it, but it's a book of Sid Felsen, Sid Felsen, well, one of the founders of Gemini of his photographs over the years, because mm -hmm. he used to use this camera, this little tiny camera that had a silent shutter so that he could take photographs of the artists working without them knowing, or like, you know, so he could just kind of take a nice photo and right. because it wasn't that click, you know, and that, that could maybe throw something off to where when someone was drawing and kind of send them out of it. And so there's this wonderful book. And if I, uh, um, I'll share it at some point, um, I'll, I'll, I'll find the title of it and get it out to you guys because it's, the photographs are just so amazing. Um, Sid was- I have that camera actually felt the, uh, that's what I do my uh, photography with the uh, Fuji X100 is the camera that has the silent shutter. That's the yeah. one, that's that's the one Sid used. And he, and he said it, uh, when I asked him about why, he said, well, the first time I took a photo of an artist working, the first thing that happened for them was they just like turned around in shock because <laughs> they, they heard the shutter because they were just so much in their own world. And, you know, so yeah, I mean, times have changed with the iPhone, it can be silent and quiet and, um, more often than not like someone's texting versus taking photos too so and and now um you, it's almost uh in some ways I, one of the first questions i ask an artist and i'm not sure if you have to do this too but is if they mind their photo being shared on social media because a lot of times people don't want half state works out there in the world because they're so unsure of what the work's going to be and i think you know, that's something that kind of communicated how much trust is in the environment of the print shop that they have to put in their printer and their publisher that when they're in that awkward halfway phase mm -hmm. of a print that they have to, you know, believe that it's going to get across the finish line. And, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that with some of Will's works because um, William Villalongo's because his, his prints have so many parts and pieces, um, you know, I was kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process working with him and getting through those kind of awkward phases in the beginning. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the first project that we did um, came out of a studio visit and he was doing these uh, 12 inch square paintings of these Vitruvian daughter figures. And they had, you know, he was, they were really, you know, he was still playing around with them. I, I don't think they were actually finished works. I mean. If you're in a studio visit, usually the artist is still working on it, right? So, um, so, but we talked about it as just a launching point. You know, the image was was really great, and and I said, well, let's, you know, my press is 24 inches. We can make it, you know, 22 inches. You know, we want to go big. So we, you know, did some just some scaling up, and then he um, started by drawing those the sunburst shape. And so in that project, you know, started with a drawing and sometimes they start, you know, projects as, you know, they start with a drawing or sometimes there is no drawing and it just starts with like maybe a shape and then things build upon it that way. But this, we actually had kind of a finished concept, which isn't always the way it is. Um, but then it had to be actualized with color. And um, so we had it, you know, we knew the hands and the hair and the eyes, but the color was a, obviously the major factor in this. And um, 
you know, we were looking at a lot of Saul Witt and how, you know, he blended color wood cut, you know, wood blocks in a really uh, be beautiful way. So that was sort of the inspiration with that. And then from there it became, you know, once you have that idea, then you have to actualize it, right? So right. it became a lot of uh, carving blocks and that part of it, which, you know, we would split it up because, you know, Will's a painter, so I wasn't gonna ask him to carve wood, wood blocks. <laughs> so I, I was carving those, but, you know, he was really um, drawing and dialing all in the details of the hands and the, you know, the fingernails and the feet and all these beautiful little details in that figure. Um, and so that became Lino and Pouchoir. So that, but that kind of stuff happened really organically. Like we did a lot of, you know, color proofing where we would just be, you know, yellows and blues. And, you know, we would just start coloring all these shapes and then start to kind of overlap them or not, you know, if there was color mixing happening or not. And that part was, it took a while. I mean, it really, um, you know, as you can see on those color, those, you know, every All piece of the pie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, okay, we have 125 C, you know, blending with 245 C, you know. So um, yeah, it was, but I mean, that's the part that I, I think is really fun. So, you know, and I think he was, you know, happy to go on that journey with me. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was, that was sort of how that one started. And then nested began um, with a, so he had had, that one began actually with a show. So he had had a show at Susan Inglet, his gallery, um, and the show was called, called Keep On Pushing. And he was doing these um, flocked cutout paper pieces. So he was cutting flocked paper and then adding collage to them, behind them. And um, because Will is so good at cutting and uh, doing stencil work, woodcut seemed like a natural launching point you know that, yeah. Right. yeah yep and so in that project actually he drew, so I just I gave him a block and he just started drawing with a sharpie on the block and so he just was drawing in pencil and then he'd erase and he'd draw in pencil in his studio and then he just started drawing it in sharpie so that was like a really fun way because he created the image right there there was no other drawing to start from yeah just getting going on a block I mean yeah, yeah I mean anytime you can get an artist to work directly on the material the better because it there's fewer translation issues and errors and things like that especially yeah. for someone who works so detailed as he does because one little thing that gets missed can be kind of catastrophic because all those little things have to fit so well with one another yes yes there's a lot of trapping <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of blending and catch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's one of the things you know that I, I definitely like to highlight with the work is it's really easy to take for granted just how difficult it is to put that stuff together because it fits so well. And I think you know there's a really nice surface feel because of the mixture of processes because you're using different processes for different texture and mm -hmm. physicality. And yeah. I think that really comes through in the finished work to whereas you're looking at something that just is what it is. It's not like a woodcut that has a really specific aesthetic and a really specific way of working or just a holograph or that choice of blending. So how, how did you come about, you know, resolving that particular work by blending holograph and woodcut? Yeah, so holograph was something that I actually had never really printed before. And it was something that Will and I talked about. And since he's a painter, it was a natural, you know, I mean, it has a different texture obviously than paint, but you know, it was a way for him to really um, create the, the hat in the piece and the bird. And, you know, and that had a very specific texture to it. And so the bird we wound up doing um, like an a la poupée, white, you know, inking and wiping. And I was using Q-tips to put in different colors and different feathers of the bird. But oh, yeah. he, he did this nice draw, you know, this, um, uh, but again, right on the block, like he sort of sketched it out and then he painted the bird in and did everything in one plate. So the bird and the hat. Um, yeah, and that was a way for, for Will to, you know, work directly on the blocks and create them that way. Yeah, the, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know the printers out at Stony Road in Dublin. 
Um, mm -hmm. They really rely on the Collagraph <clears throat> carborundum kind of painted process for their, mm -hmm. a lot of their artists because uh, they work with a lot of painters and it's a way for them to get that texture and physicality with a, a gesture they're familiar with, with tools they're familiar with. Because yeah. yep, so exactly. much of what we do is unfamiliar to them because, you know, <laughs> we're yeah. working with our <laughs> archaic processes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what we did. I mean, we did carborundum for the top part and then the bird is actually just um, molding paste. So it just right. had this shape to it, you know, but it created little pockets where you could put ink and you could, you know, and we're doing sort of like I was kind of playing with an intaglio wipe and then a relief roll on you know, on top of that right. to kind of get the maximum, <laughs> yeah, sort of like a, yeah, a maximum amount of colors in there. And uh, I mean, it really comes through in the work. I mean, it just has a, um, an ease about the, the finished, the finished piece to it. So for any of you, you know, have never seen that one in person, it, it really, the black, border like it, you really feel the figure coming out of the black and the way in which everything kind of has that three-dimensionality because that double layer of wood block it's in there with that gray run it really has a, a a great physicality to it you know which you're not necessarily i mean i talk about it in prints all the time that you know prints are um you know three-dimensional objects just really really low relief and i think <laughs> that print is one of those ones that really kind of you could really feel that like if you put your hand on it you'll be able to feel it you know yeah if you look at the back of, if you look at the back of it you can really <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> see how the cheek and more like warped and molded yeah. because of all There's that a cutting. lot of embossment just, yeah. yeah you know and I, and I and i feel like you know there's like um one of the things that really comes through in your in your work is is the level of patience that you have, um, not just for the process, but for your artists. And I think that really comes through in the prints with, with Katya and James, because that's a long-term project. So um, mm -hmm. uh, the first pair, um, Jawbreaker, um, Jawbreaker, it's, it's six play, right? And um, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and those, sure. and for, because those, those took how long to make? So they were eight months. Eight months. Yeah, eight months, which, only because that just happened to be the schedule we were on, you know, so they would come up every month, like they had their schedule to finish their carving in their studio. And then we would have our, you know, meeting the proofing day in the print shop. But yeah, eight months. And I realized after we had spoken briefly, I tend to take on these projects that are very involved <laughs> and do last many, many months. Right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we all we all have, we all have our issues <laughs> as printers. Um, complicated, long term, they seem to be some of the ones that you do. <laughs> yeah, so, specialize in. I do. Um, I tend to. I mean, I enjoy the process, right? I guess that's why I'm a printer. Um, yeah. But I like I like seeing that exploration happen with the artists, and you know, and it's interesting what you had said with um, you know about intuition with James and Katya and you know I feel like so much of too what the reason why we were able to do that project is because we I have actually known them for 20 years so I had I had met but them both when they were working at Pace and um and and I had worked with James and doing uh reduction and reduction lino cuts and I um and I had never gotten the chance to work with Katya though and so when I first, and I had always had loved her work. And so when I first opened up the print shop, she was the first artist I invited in because I really wanted to work with her. And so that was such a, you know, it was like having wanted to have worked with her for like seven right. years or eight years <laughs> and talk about time, you know? <laughs> exactly. So, I, uh, so and, and we did a, we did a reduction lino cut um, called Sailing Alone. And it's a beautiful piece. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a large reduction that she did, 20 by 16 image size. Yeah, that's a big one. Which was the size of her paintings that she was making at the time. So I feel like the way, you know, so having James and Katya come in, you know, and having done, so, cause so Katya and I actually, we had made a, a number, we've, I think we've done seven or eight editions now. And so we had done a number of reductions because it actually worked with her work as well. That was a process and she took to it really quickly i mean she's and that's not an easy process no and, it's 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 hard for a lot of people's minds to wrap around you're starting with printing one color and that little bit is going to stay and just every bit you carve away is what changes on each layer it's 
it's um it's very difficult to see in that way for many artists completely and to visualize it i mean but katya actually would come in with these really detailed uh pencil drawings and so she actually did have it all planned out beforehand so she she was you know she knew what she wanted the finished image to look like i think we even knew how many colors we wanted to do um but so they both had so much experience with that process and so that intuition was there you know to work in that medium and so when they and i can't remember i was trying to think of like who actually pitched the idea you know, that they would work together and i'm like was it james was it did i pitch that you know right. but um i think it was maybe like an opening or a dinner or something and someone said yeah let's actually you guys can do a collaboration and you'll alternate and you know and i think james actually um you know with katya they they definitely came up with the rules that was them you know in terms of like okay well whoever does the cutting the other one does the color that was their right. their rules um so I think that's why there was, you know, that they were able to, that, that, that was able to be such an intuitive process for them that it was so natural. I mean, it was so, it, it was very natural. To them. Which is insane because if people don't know, they're also life partners as well. I mean, they've been together for, as a couple for a very long time and it can get dicey to do creative things with couples. And then when you add like the added pressure of doing that with a printer and you know, and that's that stress of like, you just cut the thing that I love right off of that wood block. And that would happen. And it does. And so, yeah. you know, not only did you finish we the had press, some funny but, moments. you know, they stayed together. Yeah. So they had some funny moments. I mean, that, that definitely happened or they'd pick a color and the other one didn't like it, but you know, exactly. but they're so funny. I mean, they, they have such a good sense of humor that I think it was really crucial <laughs> for that to, you know, for that to happen, for the project to be finished and for them to be happy and sign the prints. <laughs> well, I mean, it was so successful that they, you know, you guys have undertaken another one at even a larger scale, you know, the yes. next project, you know? <laughs> yeah. And we'll probably do more colors. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we have, yeah. yeah. Cause why yeah. not? It was it was only only seven colors before. <laughs> it wasn't crazy. Oh yeah, we can do ten. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, those those projects to me were, um, you know, kind of those ones that are standouts. There's you know a lot of really beautiful work that gets made in a lot of places over the years, but it's it's pretty rare when all the stars align in just the right way, and certain pieces just have have something about them and a sparkle about them. And I remember seeing them uh, when I saw them for the first time it was at an EAB fair I think it was the last I guess the one of the last second ones to last because that was 2018 yeah and then there was a 2019 yeah um and I remember seeing them from across the room and going is that James's or is that Katya's I remember having <laughs> that thought in my mind when I walked up and I'm like it's both of them that's why I can't <laughs> figure it out <laughs> you know that's why I was confused and it was just you know they're an immediate draw from across the room. They, you know, they're not tiny prints, but they feel much bigger than they are. They have a lot of uh, life and personality to them, which is, I think, a really difficult thing to pull off on any work of any medium. But they really do have that presence. And, you know, for me, I think a lot of it comes down to the attention that you um, put in that process of helping them make sure they're getting every detail right. You know, because I know that both of them are hyper detail oriented and so mm -hmm. are you. I mean, were there times in your process where you guys are like, we just have to move on with this because three perfectionists in the room at once <laughs> may never get anything done? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. We did have that sort of like daily time, you know, like we would only have so many hours together. So they had a drive, whether it was back to Massachusetts or New York at the end of the day, at the end of the workday. I mean, and sometimes they would actually stay over, you know, if we were able to, sometimes we would work like two days in a row, but right. um, usually they would, you know, at six o'clock or, you know, they would be like, okay, we have to leave. So we would, that was our deadline, you know, so we had to get everything right. And, and at a certain point, you know, like four o'clock, you're going, okay, we need to have this proof be the proof that I'm going to audition when you guys, you know, go back to uh, your studio. So it was really, in some ways, it's funny because it was drawn out, but the actual working part was very concentrated and really productive, you know, so we would have right. a really intense day 
of carved, you know, they would come in with carved blocks, but then there would be color proofing and then there'd be, you know, corrections that needed to be made on the block. So they'd be carving those and fixing those and there'd be chatter or something that, you know, wasn't, wasn't, in, I didn't want in the picture. So I think, um, yeah, it, it, you know, it was a intense, the collaboration part was intense. Yeah, but so much of it was done, you know, by them because they would carve the blocks separately and they wouldn't right. show the other ones. So there was this reveal that would happen and we'd all be like, oh my God, what did you, what did you do? <laughs> what happened? You know? But it was so exciting. I mean, it was so exciting. It was, I think, you know, and they had never collaborated visually before, you know, they, they make music together but they right. had actually never made art to get work together. So um, it was such a intuitive <laughs> way for them to collaborate um, that sort of layer by layer in a way, you know, like a chess, we sort of talk about it like a chess game, you know, move by move, you know, they'd be making their advancement in the image. Yeah, and I think, you know, for them, I mean, I can, I can understand why a lot of artists wouldn't want to get involved in a collaborative piece with another artist because um, the things you hold precious and dear are not necessarily the things that others hold precious and dear. You know, and artists who've had long careers and um, their work has been, you know, seen widely really know the difference between what's important to them and what's the, important for their audience and that you know, they can kind of compartmentalize those things and keep them separate, right? So like, I've done this and this is what I want out of my work, but this is what I want to give you as the audience. But when you add that other person in there who also has a hand in what the finished product's actually going to look like, it, it can be really difficult to be able to have their personal desires, your personal desires, as well as a team desire for the public to actually make yeah. it through all of that complication. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, such a huge leap of faith. I mean, yeah. huge. And also because it was reduction, there was no going back. <laughs> so <laughs> there was, yeah, it was, we could only move forward. Whatever we did, we could only move forward. And, it, you know, and it was in a funny way, it's almost counterintuitive in the fact that the more, like say the more James cut on his round of cutting, the more he cut away on the block, the more that's actually revealing what Katia had done the layer before. So it was like, you know, if you, if you didn't want to reveal what the other one had done, you actually wouldn't cut at all <laughs> or right. you would cut very minimally. <laughs> so, you know, there was- So we get oh, covered yeah. up, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so the, the bold carving and the bold moves actually left more of the prior layer. So that was, always, you know, it was, it was a huge leap of faith on both their parts. And um, well, and I have to really stress you as a publisher as well, because in, in reduction cutting, you start off with a giant pile of paper and you only end up with what makes it through the printing process in right. the end. And so every time you add another layer, there's another level of proofing that has to happen and risk for, you know, slight printing flaws or errors that all inevitably occur. And so you, you're losing sheets every mm -hmm. layer you put on. And then you end up with what you end up with. You know, one of the things that I love like looking at it is the addition sizes are not the same. Yes. 22 <laughs> and 25, <Yeah. laughs> you know, which tells you a whole lot. You're like, well, that one needed a little more love. Yeah. <laughs> it still lost a few more sheets, you yeah. know, and that's the kind exactly. of like subtle detail that a lot of people don't pick up on. That's like, so oh. true that you noticed that there was three, oh, yeah. there were three off, <laughs> three off, <laughs> you know, because you couldn't get them, you know, because yep. they, they were lost in the process. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, it's those little details that really add a lot to the story of making a work. And, you know, because it, it just really shows, you know, the risk that's involved. And for you, you know, not just as the printer, and we talked about this a little bit, you know, when I was, because I'd asked you, you know, why did you open your own studio? And, and it, a lot of it came down to want, getting to do the projects you always wanted to do. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, exactly. And, yeah. I, and I, I always say that too for myself. It's like, sometimes we want to work with an artist because we just want to want to work with them. We, we just love them as people. And, mm -hmm. and that time together is really precious. And other times it's because you want to own their work and it's the only way you're going to get to own their work because maybe you can't afford it any other way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, that was, that was the case for me when I did a print for Raymond Pettibone. I was like, I can't afford it, but I want it. 
so I'm going to try to figure out a way to get to do a print for Ray. And that was, you know, so I could do that. Um, yeah. We did yeah, get this question I, about paper that came through. And what paper did you print James and um, Katia's print on? And how do, you, how do you come about your paper selection? Because material is really important in the things that you do. Yeah, um, James and Katia, their prints are on uh, BFK. And that's purely um, just uh, like, it's a, a functionally, it's a really good paper because it doesn't have a lot of stretch. And that was right. so important with doing a reductive process over eight months, the paper had to be dimensionally stable. Um, the Villalongo pieces are on, I think one is on Hosho, which is a paper I love. I just, I love the way it prints and it's a bright white show, you know, it shows color really nicely. Um, and I think the other one also might be BFK. BFK is sort of like my shop paper. You know, every shop kind of has their own papers. And I find, cause so like, if you'll notice with the, the nested piece with Will, that was wet processes and dry process. So the BFK was functional in that way too. It's a really versatile paper. Um, the, the Vitruvian's daughter was all printed dry. But uh, when you're dampening a sheet of paper that's going damp and then it's being uh, dry. dried, re-registered for what, you know, like all that shrinking and contraction, you know, huh. the paper is going crazy. It's all over the place. Um, you need something that's really consistent. So that paper. Especially for like James and Katya's print, the fact that it took eight months, that's, that's a lot of climactic change of the yes. seasons in that period. So that paper is going to want to go. I've had gets paper. Warp, you know, yeah, it yeah. gets ugly. And, I had yeah, economy will change a quarter of an inch once on me because spring came. I was printing in the winter. And I had to, I had to take a break from printing because of a, a family thing that had occurred. And I came back and it had been raining and all of a sudden it was spring and the paper was literally a quarter of an inch longer. You know, yeah. I know it's amazing. And actually, you know, speaking of Yasu and um, Emma, that the largest uh, Japanese style woodcut that's ever been made, Emma. Yeah. And he was, that was his first project when he came to Pace and this was probably 2002. And speaking of humidity and paper, he created like a, a room with plastic. Like he put up these plastic walls and he had um, like a humidifier in there and he was testing and always keeping track of the humidity in that room. And so when he would miss his paper, it was really consistent because that print was so large and it was so many colors and it took place over at least a year or more. Yeah, I can't remember now. Might've been two years that he worked on that project. And so he was, we would, he was sort of like behind this shower curtain you know, <laughs> working in there, but it was like stepping into like a, you know, a mist, like a highly humid, you know, high humidity. Yeah, like somebody's orchid house or something. Yeah, an orchid house, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, but that's why they always say like tamarind is great, right? Because it's dry. So the humidity oh, is yeah. consistent. When I, when I, when the I went desert. to tamarind 20 years ago or whatever, it was, um, the only thing you really had to worry about was temperature because in the morning it'd be 60 degrees and it'd be like a hundred by afternoon. Right. Your inks are to, just running all over the place. Yeah. So like the ink you had in the morning was nice and tight and then it's yeah. literally pouring off your slab by the end of the day. <laughs> like they have a nice new studio now, like a long time ago when they were in, in the space that they were in, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, rain didn't usually hit the ground there. Like you could watch right. the rain come down and go right back up. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, they have totally, so a lot of the technical stuff that works really well for tamarind only works at a high altitude desert. <laughs> so yeah. like, it just doesn't work anywhere else. So yeah, New exactly. York is actually one of the more challenging places to print because it's crazy humid. It gets super dry and super cold. It gets really yeah. hot. It has uh, wild, wild fluctuations versus just like, you know, yeah. super humid all the time or super dry all the time or something that you can maintain consistency yeah, yeah which I mean, is hard with selections. these long-term print yeah with these long-term yeah. projects to get your paper yep yeah, yeah i had to build uh i had to um plastic wrap with a dehumidifier inside a drying rack before to shrink paper 
Yeah. It got too humid. It swelled up. And I was like, well, I got to make it small again. So I just wrap it and suck all the water out. Yeah, I know. It's like amazing. Two days. Yeah. You know, I know it's, it's amazing what, what we do. I know, or whether you're, you spend like, you know, week calendaring every sheet before you print it. But, you know, back in the day, I would go to, you know, speaking of papers, it's like, you know, I would love to go to New York Central, you know, and I would just right. go upstairs and I'd see David and I'd be like, what do you got? You know, you go through all the racks and all the, things and you know he had such there were such amazing papers there and that's such a loss I find you know I mean we have talent was, and yeah. Romy, but in terms of being able to just step into a place and actually have all those papers in a drawer was yeah I used to take artists who were like we were maybe not sure what to what to do they had some ideas but they weren't really sure where to start when I was at UOE they have the most enviable paper closet in any print shop I've ever seen or heard of Tanya, it started with Tanya Grossman. She would collect paper from all over the world. So when she would travel somewhere, she would find paper and she'd be like, oh, I've got 300 sheets of this random unnamed thing from Romania or this yeah. crazy thick pulpy <laughs> paper from Canada or like stuff from Japan, like all over. And so the paper closet would be a place where we would start a lot of projects. Like yeah. with Terry Winters in particular, it was, he had some ideas, but he wanted to work backwards from the paper. And so mm -hmm. we would just essentially go shopping. And, and I continued that process after I had left UOE yeah. at New York Central. Yeah, but we'd just too. go look at paper and mm -hmm. feel things and touch things and see what color people responded to. There was a project I did, like, I think it was in 2014 or 15 with Chuck Webster. And he was using some 1954 uh, Jay Wattman paper, this powder blue paper that um, Leslie Miller had, Leslie from Grenfell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and he was like Phil I want to use this paper and I was like well let's see if we can get some from Leslie so we traded out for the full suite of Chuck's prints for the paper but yes. it meant we only had this really finite amount to work with or this and it was right. crazy difficult to print on <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like I was like why did we do that yeah <laughs> there's no ordering it, anymore yeah <laughs> yeah and it was just yeah it was a nightmare to print I had to like soak a sheet of holland roll behind it and dump a piece of, you know, like $8 paper every time we pull an impression just to oh, hydrate wow. it properly to take yeah, it. Yeah. The things we do yeah. <laughs> that no one ever knows about <laughs> just to get ink on paper. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, for you, you know, give people maybe a, a rough timeline of what's coming up with James and Katya's new um, collaborative reduction cut so they can keep tabs with you and check in with you over time on how that project's going. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that they'll come back now um, in the summer, you know, maybe June or July, depending on they, um, they have the blocks. And so they're in their studio. And, you know, we were just waiting for everything to kind of open up again. So I was able to see them one one day last October. And that's where we were able to pull uh, the first proofs. And I've since additioned all, all that and they have the blocks. But that this project is obviously going a lot slower. I mean, we would have been done, I think, if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So, um, but it's moving slowly, you know, right. slowly. <laughs> and um, and I have other projects, you know, coming sort of down the line. And it's been really interesting. You know, if and I think we had talked about this too, Phil, at one point, like if you have a relationship with an artist and, you know, you had said this even in your beginning, um, your opening uh, with the slides that, it's like picking up um, kind of where you left off. Like if you have a working relationship with an artist, it's like you can put the book down and then you can pick it up again and put it down. And then the, but, you know, trying to, like I'm trying to start some new projects with some artists I haven't worked with before. And it's just, it's sort of impossible. I find just to try to do things um, remotely. So it's so much of it, it starts with play. It has to start with play, I think, in, in the print shop. And there, that's a really important part of it where an artist feels like they can play and things can fail and we can move on. And it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. So nothing has to come forth like perfect. It, it, there's so much room for experimentation. And I think that's so important. Yeah. I mean, I've been having, I have a few projects that have just been taking way longer than they should because the person isn't right there when you're printing to ask the question right? They're like, oh, well, why does it look like that? Or could it look like this? Because they're present, right? So of course, you know, that it's slow a, that happens when you're in a studio. Yeah, it's working it's, through the mail sucks. I think that's what every yeah. printer I've talked to <laughs> during the pandemic, we all been like, we just want people to be back in the same yeah. room. <laughs> because that's yeah. just what we do. It is a collaboration. And I think Completely. that proximity really does mean a great deal. And 
it's the same thing I think like looking at art online, right? It's it's for to like to describe people who don't make work. There's it's one thing when you see it online and it's like this big and you can kind of zoom in on a corner maybe depending on the quality of somebody's website or right. <laughs> you know, the way they've set it up because sometimes you can only see just the middle zoomed up or right. you know and so I kind of equate it to that versus getting to go see it in person right yeah. where, where you can maybe touch it and handle it or get close to it and it's just night and day and you know for some like for you you had that reaction with with Sarah's chair you're like it's that small I'm like yeah because yeah. <laughs> everybody has their own idea like how big this thing is you know and um but no it's really it's really an intimate scale work and i think that's one of the things that people really love about it is its intimacy you know is that it has you know it draws you in in that way and that's what makes those things work so so beautifully i think for a lot of people whereas sometimes you just want it to be huge you know you just want it to be way bigger than you as a person you want it to be the world that you're seeing and you know, those decisions are best made in person. So yeah, yeah. I commend you for trying to keep a project like that going. Because <laughs> it's <laughs> you know, yeah. for those of you out there who are wondering how we're all doing it, we're all trying to get through our backlog of stuff through the pandemic, mm-hmm. hoping that we don't run out before yeah. <laughs> before we can really all be back together again. Because <laughs> there'll be this mad dash of trying to get stuff done here over, I feel like over the summer. So. Yeah, I mean, and, and I feel and people have been able to do lots of collaborations, you know, remotely, and, and they, they can, can work and it really depends on the printer and the artist. And but if they have, I feel like if they've had that relationship, it's so much easier to just have that conversation because you know each other so well. But if you don't have a working relationship with an artist yet, it's, it's hard to kind of pick, pick that process up. Yeah, I mean, uh... Zoom doesn't doesn't do it justice for right. yeah. getting to know someone necessarily. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You, know, you only get a you only get a slice uh, a slice of the world. I mean, there there's a lot to be said with having lunch and or dinner with one another and spending that kind of off time with one another to be able to get that understanding of what someone means with what they say, not necessarily just what they say or yeah. what they mean when they point or scratch their head or, right like you said yeah. a lot of pointing yeah i mean because, <laughs> like, oh, because collaborating with an artist in the studio is like you're there like you're stepping into their space even though maybe it's your print shop but it's their creative space so right you know the how that relation you know how you kind of step back or you know like all that stuff is so intuitive and it's just it's it's something that you can only do when you're working with someone in real like you know because it's so yeah. you really are like just two your two heads over a press <laughs> you know exactly. looking at something <laughs> you know and and figuring things out on the fly it's so kind of in the moment you know I really yeah. love the way you said even though it's your print shop it's their creative space I think that's the best way to encapsulate what it's like that mm-hmm. I've heard yet of what it's like when an artist is in this when they're in your studio yeah I, I think it's a really graceful way of putting it. it it is their creative space i think for a lot of people who are not involved with what we do they really wonder like how do we make it happen for each artist because the artists we work with are all so different i think that explains it so clearly it is your shop but it's their space mm-hmm. i think that's a really yeah. it's a great way of saying it i'm gonna have to quote you on that at some point <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's, it's really a grace it's a grace it's a graceful way of thinking about it and you know, it's, I always try to encourage people to think about elements of collaboration in their own life and when it goes well and when it doesn't and why, you know, and usually it's when one person can't let go of something that needs to be moved on from that it doesn't work. And I think, you know, it can be anybody's role. It can be the printer's problem of, no, this is so good. It's so good. But the artist is like, no, it needs to die. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I want to throw it away. <laughs> yeah. so, and they're like, but it's great. And they're like, sometimes things just need to die. So, <laughs> you know, so I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I want to make, you know, see if there's any other questions that people have um, out there. So by all means, throw them out. Um, we, we appreciate you guys coming along for the ride with us because sometimes it's easy when we're having a conversation like this to get lost in our own conversation. But so if you guys have questions, by all means, um, shoot them out. And um, I wanted to, you know, thank both Chris and May for coming on this episode because I really feel like you guys have 
a lot of the same enthusiasm for prints and, and the world and, and the way in which you go about it. And I think the, it's nice to see it from the opposite ends, you know, so from the production mm -hmm. end. And then, because I always talk about this line of where, you know, where the artist and the printer's job ends, the, the viewer and the collector's job begins. And I, and I think it's a really, you know, this is a nice relationship to be able to demonstrate that in a, in a viewing like this. Chris, did you have any questions for me? I just want to make a comment. I mean, now it's been fantastic listening to uh, May, you know, talk. And I, want, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but for me, something that was so transformative as I was becoming, I guess, a collector was that was the step I made from working with um, folks who I was acquiring prints from to that day I stepped into the print shop, to, into the studio, you know, and um, that was a time fourth estate, you know, of course, Phil as well. But it was up and running, and that was that was an amazing time. But even before that, Two Palms and, and Larissa at ULAE, and I really got the bug by getting close to the process. I don't know what it was. And the Dunham print, I didn't really explain earlier what really got me about that print, but now maybe it makes more sense now to explain it, um, having listened to May, is sort of when it when I saw it in person, it was opened up in front of me, like I mentioned, it was the smell of that print, the ink. It was like it had just come off the press or something. It was so you know, noticeable and um, unforgettable, really, you know. And that's all. That's never translated in a JPEG, you know. But hey, um, but I'll tell you, during the we all mark about we all have a marker during the pandemic. Well, I bought five prints during the pandemic, all right, on, and then seeing none of them in person. But I woke up a few times thinking, oh my God, I've got to buy support the print world. And so here we are, you know. But I think. <laughs> um, we need more people to wake up in the middle of night feeling that way. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> well, if there was an element of at least a couple, this could be the last chance. And I, you know, we've already covered that ground tonight, right? But um, yeah. you know, I do want to mention though also Betsy Senior. I wouldn't be sitting here today talking to you without without her um, mentorship really and her and her own enthusiasm for prints and her knowledge, which um, is well known in the print world, but it's worth a saying here it was really um she's really remarkable and, and uh so important to me um at that time and beyond yeah well and that's a nice circle back to what may was talking about with her gallery and the, and the function of the print shop as being a, a an education space on so many levels of, of being able to welcome people into a space where not only the people working there and people who own it are willing to be open with their knowledge and share it but help infect others with that curiosity about process and why an artist chooses to do something and why something's important to exist in the first place you know the value of an artist's voice you know so i feel like um we all have different art educators in that way that we've come across out out in the world and you never forget them because they really create your lifelong love of of being open to something uh, an idea or perspective you may never even considered before you know i think May can definitely attest to this. As printers, we're constantly being asked to step into a world of work we may not even fully understand, but have to help them make it because it might be coming really from left field and it takes us a while to learn about it and we have to be willing to learn about it too. So I think that's a really, really fun thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, this is something that I've been meaning to ask guests in the past, but um, I haven't really got a chance, but I kind of got a little bit of a chance here tonight. Um, what uh, what artists are you guys looking at right now that you want to share? Are there any that you want to share with people? Is there anyone that, that's kind of new to you? That I'm looking at in terms of publishing or um, just or looking just, at? Like, just, just looking at, I just interested work. in right now. Yeah, like something that you're seeing. Oh, I think um, Aaron Gilbert, um, you know, he just had a show at PPOW and his work is really, um, it, it's something, you know, I was introduced to his work like last, uh, I guess about a year ago and, um, or maybe two, any, I don't know, the, the years start to get, this past year has been strange. <laughs> I think it was a year ago. I just tacked one more year on because <laughs> <But Probably anyway. laughs> uh, last year just doesn't, it's going to be lost in time. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, he has, uh, he's a really, really original, interesting figurative painter. And I've just, I've never seen any any work like, I've never seen work like that before. Um, and, you know, and I haven't actually seen, I haven't been to a gallery in a year. I actually haven't seen a show in person yet. So that's sort of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I still wanted to see the Hockney and um, I just, I, 
that'll be that'll be there. I'm getting there, you know. <laughs> I'm finally <laughs> gonna reemerge. But I think not seeing art in person for a year has been a, a huge loss, and and it's really been you know looking at stuff right. online and trying to see as much stuff as online. But yeah, or even just fairs. I mean, I you know freeze is happening. I mean, I, it's like people are there and they're at an art fair. So I I um. Yeah, I, um, you'll get there. I'll get there. Yeah, I'll get there. <laughs> Is there someone you've been looking at, Chris? Oh boy, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of folks. Like a lot of ways I could answer that. I guess another another work that I acquired in the past few months or so is a drawing by um, um, Heejin Heejin Yu, who is an artist represented by Half Gallery, H I E J I N U. Y O O. She's terrific. Great painter. Um, so I, and I, um, I think she's really making a mark. So that's, that's been uh, exciting. Also with Jack Hanley, um, Emma Coleman's had a couple of shows there. I think she's terrific. And I've bought a bit of her work and have been working with some clients on that. And also Nikki Malouf also at Hanley, I, I think is fantastic. EJ Hauser has a show at Derek Geller up right now. Um, it's not new to me. I own, I own her work, but I think she's, Fabulous. So the list is, you know, I mean, my wish list, though, to, to some of you said earlier, um, some artists like Terry Winters, for example, I don't own and I would I still would love to own Terry Winters. So I haven't abandoned that space at all. You know, it's sort of like uh, I have a wish list over there, too. And he's on it, you know, for example. So I, I mean, Terry, I think kind of circling back was one of those artists who it took me a little while to really understand where he was coming from with his work to be able to help him as a collaborating printer with him. And there's a few, I have a few prints of his that I worked on with him that when people say, what are those prints that you'd never let go of? And one of those prints is one of Terry's. It's just, you know, it's how we, it gets, it's not just because it's such a good work, but also because it really, working on that project with him really changed my perception of his work and how I looked at other people's work. You know, yeah. occasionally a project like that comes along where your own view of the world gets shifted and. So I, I can understand why you might want something of Terry's. Uh, <laughs> so. but, you know, on the other hand, I've placed his work with clients, I think, two or even three times, you know, and so that's been wonderful. It's been fantastic, you know, and some of those big suites of prints, you know, too, that you can't own that unless you have the right space, for example, right? as you know, those addition of uh, those suites of 10 or whatever the heck they are, they're kind of amazing, but they need the right home to give that the space and love that they deserve, right? So. That's right. I mean, because I mean, a, a big change for me was when I got to see his portfolio of um, field notes that he did of etchings with spit bites with Aldo Cromwell. And that completely changed my perception, not just of his work, but of the process of spit bite and how Aquatint could really be a transformative process in a different way. And that's just because I got to spend time with him in person, you know, to flip through them. And yeah, so for me, someone, I mean, I'm getting ready to do a project with this artist, Tomary Dodge. He's based out in LA and it was a project that he and I were supposed to start um, just over a year ago. And it's been being kicked down the can, you know, the can kicked down the road on the calendar where this is the fifth time we've rescheduled when we're gonna work on the project because it was always like, well, the pandemic's gonna be gone in June. And then, but then by the end of the summer, we're like, all right, well, let's put it on the calendar. And so, um, so if y'all stay tuned, you might, I might be able to uh, do a, a live thing with the project that he and I are working on here at the end of the month. So, but that's, that's who I've been kind of obsessing over trying to make some work with for over a year and we haven't been able to do anything. <laughs> so it's been kind of crazy. Um, one of the questions that was asked, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask this uh, if you may, to you, May, um, says, are there any cases where as a printer, you prevailed on an artist and brought them around to seeing something in a process as you see it? And it says, or would that be malpractice for a printer? <laughs> <laughs> I love the way the malpractice. malpractice. <laughs> That's why I was like, I have to read this question. Yeah, that is really funny. Um, I would say no, not usually. I mean, I feel like my role is actually like a as a printer, you know, as, as a publisher, you have ideas of images that you want to see, you know, but as a printer, you know, I'm there to kind of guide the artist and what they want to do. So it's rarely, you know, unless an artist is unsure, obviously, you know, I offer an opinion or For something, sure, but yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. But I mean, for the most part, unless it's some outlandish thing where I'm just like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> I think um, the, I think it's, the, I always, and maybe that's just also, you know, the school, like, that was very much how I was taught was that the artist, um, you know, it's their work, it's their idea, it's their vision, and you're there to help bring that into the, into the world, you know, as, right. as they want it, you know, and so how can you make that as seamless as possible for them? Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever had a thing where I said, oh, let's, you know, and it's probably, you know, minor things. I mean, what, besides, you know, the basic conversations are, what medium are we working in? What's the imagery? How are we going to, you know, what's, how, how many should we, you know, like all these, right. once you kind of get past that big conversation, you know, are these monotypes, you know, are these uh, very small addition, you know, are we doing suites of three, you know? So, I mean, once you get past those major questions, I think everything is, is sort of game because you set the perimeters for the project. You know, you have a general idea of what you're going to be doing. Yeah. I mean, I think sometimes the only time I go off into that is if I've, I've had a, a good, longer working relationship with an artist and it's more about coming up with like some crazy idea for them but it's still all about their work it's not like you would you wouldn't give that same idea <laughs> yeah i definitely wouldn't put it in malpractice it, it, it might be um the artist might uh might look back on it and be like why did you plant that seed yeah. <laughs> you know because <laughs> it's something they can't ever shake you know because yeah. i think you're like james because like you know it took me 14 years to figure out <laughs> a monotype process that would work for him yes and yeah. because i was like you really should make this i feel like this you could own this space really well like yeah. if there's something here for you but he was always like no that that idea is not good phil that's not a good <laughs> idea and then then one day i came up with one and he was like mm, that's an interesting idea <laughs> so, but yeah it takes a long time and i think i think to you know answer the malpractice i think I don't know a printer that goes that would cross that line, you know, I'm, because it really, we are really making their work. You know, that's, that's the goal. Like we're working together towards to realize their vision. Right. And that's, you know, right. That, and maybe the, the there's point. ideas that are coming out. Maybe you're pitching an idea, you know, and it yeah. could fall flat, you know, oh, yeah, <laughs> often does. Just like yeah. The rock lands in the middle of the, you know, but I think it's always as a printer, right. You're always trying to pitch maybe an idea or a process or something. And sometimes it, yeah, the artist goes, no, nah, that's some good. <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> it goes, Oh yeah, that could be interesting. How about this? You know, I mean, that dot, that dialogue is always happening. Right. I mean, and I'm really glad when an artist can, uh is really forthcoming like i always appreciate when an artist says no i don't want to do that because right, right. we learn a lot as printers about them and their goals as an artist when they say nope i don't ever want to do that or yep. you know because like oh there is a boundary line here yeah you know, like that okay now we know that i think it helps us even make better suggestions then like artists who are just like i don't know all the time i'm always like yep now nobody knows <laughs> it's like right. we have no right. we don't someone, know where the edges are someone has to be definitive yeah exactly <laughs> at some point yeah. someone exactly. has to step in and say okay <laughs> sorry guys one thing that's one thing as a collector over the years i've found a bit elusive is understanding why that medium for that print and who really influenced that it's not something that i think we're talking about it here but in the books or maybe i haven't picked up on it but i always kind of wonder how that point gets reached you know so it's interesting yeah, I mean, a lot of times it's, um, I mean, I've had this happen a lot where an artist comes in and says, I saw these etchings that did this process by so-and-so, I want to do that. And you're like, all right, that's where we're starting, you know, and it's, and it may be really weird to think about doing that project, that process for a project with that artist, because you're like, wow, that's so out of character for their way they draw, or even just the way they think about how they put stuff together. And and so sometimes it goes off in left field because like their friend did something or um, sometimes I, I, I've had this one, like the baggage of processes that were horrible experiences in college. Like I've had artists tell me, I will never make a lithograph. I hate that process. And they're like, well, why? And like, I took lithography in college. It's the worst process ever. I was like, well, cause you didn't know what the hell you were doing, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I've had about artists where it's like, it's taken me like, I had to do like 20 etchings before I could get them around to doing a litho, which was like better for them. Cause they were trying to make etchings look like lithos or something or mm -hmm. vice versa, you know? So 
So a lot of times, yeah, I think there's, it's so random a lot of the time. I, I wish I could help you out on that, Chris, but it's like, some of it has to do with the skills of the printer. It's like we all are better at certain processes mm -hmm. than other. I would say most printers have a working knowledge of all the processes at, at this point in printmaking's you know, evolution. But you're, you know, you, there are things that you're better at or maybe you think better at the way you put them, the images together or organize them and stuff. And right. so sometimes it's just like, oh, I'm working with May. And so I love what she does. And like relief print or the way she prints an etching. So I want to do that with May, right? So then right. sometimes like, it's like a printer's reputation kind of creates of that, even though the printer mm -hmm. hasn't said anything, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that can happen too, you know, for a lot of, a lot of artists because they're just like, oh, you make really nice screen prints. And they're right. like, okay, I, think I guess most, I'm making Yeah, different. I think most printers at a certain point, they actually have sort of like a specialty, you know? And like Phil said that they, you know, they have knowledge about a lot of different mediums. And sometimes maybe you bring in another printer for that. Maybe you don't want to do that screen printing. You know, I'm not particularly, I'm not a screen printer. So, you know, but maybe a project does call for screen, you know, screen printing. So Chris, I, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I think we all sort of asked ourselves that, you know, how does something get to exist right. in a medium? And I guess maybe painters are drawn to one sort of thing. And I, but I think of artists like, for example, Ryan and Trevor Oaks, who are known as photographers really so how does someone like that and they've done prints at ULE how, where, how do they get to I guess they did etchings I can't remember what they did there exactly but in any event that's I find fascinating is that crossover medium sort of well decision. I mean I can yeah. speak to them specifically because I did some prints for them um, that were published by David Crute um, and we did monotypes with them and they came in with tools they wanted to use right to create this pattern structure for their work and they, they had these things and I, they were like, what can we do with these? And I was like, we're making monotypes. <laughs> Cause <laughs> I was like, you know, I was like, well, cause if I use them in this process or that process, it's not gonna hold the mark in this, the way that they were describing they were trying to get. Cause you know, they were like showing me how they stamped these things. And I was like, well, you know for the immediacy they were going for. So it made sense to make monotypes with them because they came to me with these things. And, you know, so sometimes that's, that's what it is too. It's like an artist. Right says you yeah know, i mean each shop sort of has a culture i mean some studios like an artist just comes in and does monotypes right away if they're a painter like that's just how they start and yeah. some you know so i think each studio is so specific and i think sort of going back to what you were saying phil is that each print shop does have kind of a maybe a thing that they're kind of they do or that they kind of specialize in with of course there being a wide umbrella where they can branch out i mean two palms yeah. obviously is so creative and they're doing so many different things but um yeah i mean they kind of specialize in crazy i mean that's, yeah. <laughs> right maybe that's, <laughs> that's like, like like the most kind of like uh, like direct well, way i could describe like, it I'm like, like they have that hydraulic press and so once you have that right that just opens up a whole other right you can stamp can out a worm. bumper for a car you know what, what, what are you going to yeah. do with this thing you know you can't just like make a monotype right <laughs> they're, they're kind of, they're kind of crazy, really appealed to my film business side. And we bonded instantly, I think, because they pushing the limits is what it's about. I love, yeah. I love how they do it. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I also always go back to like Gemini as the foundation of crazy. You know, it's like they were they were the print shop that went super huge first, mm -hmm. cross process first. Like like when you think about like what they've done, they they paper making. Yeah, they shattered the mold of mm -hmm. what a print could or or it should be a long time ago and and they've been able to maintain that consistency for such a long period of time like you know they did these there was one of the images in the book of daniel buren um screen prints and when you look at it in the book you just see like oh it's these beautiful color stripes but it's actually like in each layer is on a separate piece of mylar and they all have to sit and float in a certain way because it creates a certain visual effect and they're like held on the wall by these two little magnets and it's it's a super pristine thing, but from a, like a technical perspective, it's one of the most insane things you can do is to print large flats on mylar because it's so staticized. It just it will suck dust from across the room and stick it on, and you have a spot <laughs> and you have to throw it away. And like I looked at that and I was like, I asked Joni, I was like, so how long does that actually take to print? Because I bet that took a long time. She goes, don't even ask me. <laughs> and it's just you know, you know, it's just like because that's like one of those crazy things. But it was like an appropriate material. To work with because it's not 
it's not paper it's not, it wouldn't have looked the same on paper it, it wouldn't have had that presence but yeah i feel like two palms and and gemini are really that kind of those are well unless, in your dna to do something different you know i i think fourth estate it must be said again was also um what glenn Baldridge was doing there was astounding in some of those ca uh, some cases you know um and 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 that was also Again, it's really about how you, how do they do it, you know, how, and that is so exciting in printmaking, you know, it's in, not not always the case, right? Let's face it. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess you know, it really comes down to uh, printers and publishers not being willing to say no. <laughs> so so when the artist comes, you're like, I got this thing. <laughs> or have you ever and seen never, broken glass yeah. before? I was like, well, yeah. We're like, let's make right. something out of that. <laughs> yeah, so. and I know, Phil. You're at the crux of what you're like. Yeah, it can be done, but here's the actually what it's going to take to do it right you know that's, all aspects. that's the moment right so <laughs> yeah i mean it's you know our job as printers is to say yes and then figure it out you know it's like <laughs> that's our job you know and there's you know the, i think the those of us that specialize in collaboration versus additioning is because we have we have saying no problems <laughs> and the people who are really great addition printers are really good at saying no because everything's saying, nope, it's just the way it's gonna be <laughs> you know i'm telling you know it tells you a lot about me i'm like additioning yeah i do it but it's not my it's not my forte that level of zen activity is hard for me <laughs> so uh, but you know that saying yes place is yeah that's that's what uh, right. I mean, that's the, well, that's the fun part of, I mean, some, so, you know, the way I work is like that. It's like, we're in the studio, we're collaborating, we're saying yes to everything, you know, we're having fun, we're making all these ideas and changes and, and then, okay, now I have to go back and replicate that BAT. So I have to now go through every single note that I hopefully have been taking down during all this fun and say yes moment. <laughs> and then and then the months of you know additioning kicks in so yeah it is two different i think in some ways though you have to kind of liberate yourself to be in that creative exciting right. where you get kind of wrapped up in it and the artist is excited and you're excited and you know and that's so important to give yourself that space so but that is kind of one half of your brain that gets that is in that creative part and then the other half is going okay now i'm the methodical additioning printer that needs to now just every day be inking these blocks you know and and printing you know so it is two kind of halves of the same coin i guess yeah but, i mean i've i've definitely found that i can't listen to the news while i audition because oh that really messes, <laughs> yeah totally messes up because you're like what just happened and you're just like it's like <laughs> It's like in certain music for certain projects, just doesn't work. You yeah, because you're just like your brain is just no not music. You got addition to music. Yeah, it got always to addition music. to music. Yeah, like yeah. podcasts don't work for me because you're like, oh, that's really fascinating. And the next yeah. thing, I'm like, I just overlap no. this plate. You know? It's yeah, like, no. <laughs> music. You have to have music. It's so important. I mean, music yeah. is important throughout the whole thing. I mean, I feel like music really? is important in the studio. I mean, we were talking about that. It's like, who? What music are you gonna play? Or is there no music? But I feel like every artist likes to have music playing in the studio. So they do, and usually, you know, you want the artist to be picking the music because, like you said, it's it's their creative space, and um, it does determine quite a lot of how things go. You know, because some people's taste in music is really wild or really out there, and and other people it's like so mainstream like you're just like wow i'm listening to this pop music all day <laughs> like i had no idea this is what you were into <laughs> it's like and it's, sometimes you're just like i wish they'd shut it off yeah. but it uh, you know it tells you it does tell you a lot um about the artist's motivation with the with the types of creative things they surround themselves with you know the types of music yeah so yeah i always appreciate it when artists bring in new music yeah. I think the artist who brought in the consistently the most in music I've ever worked with was Enrique Chigoya. Like I, he never brought the same thing in twice. It was always something different. He's, he's a serious consumer of music. Cool. And it's just yeah. like always, and I'm always like, what is this? <laughs> like he's always bringing <laughs> stuff out of the, out of the woodwork. You know, he was, I think he's, he takes the cake for, for out there when it comes to of that for me for artists i work with but yeah it's it's definitely and the environment it really helps create the environment you know, mm -hmm. that people work in and so 
Well, we should probably wrap it up. We've been chit chatting for a while. I'm not getting any more, we're getting a lot of nice comments, um, and, uh, but no more questions. So I just want to say thank you to the both of you. It's been a really fun conversation and a great way to wrap up this first series. And to all of you who've been participating, I'm going to send a survey out relatively soon to figure out summertime plans and times that uh, can work to get the most people involved. And we'll do a, a short summer program and there's things that you guys are wanting to hear about, learn more about, especially if it's something in the book that you're like, I really want to know more about that. Let me know and I'll see if I can get the artist involved or the publisher involved um, for that particular conversation. I've got a few really um, fun ones lining up um, for you guys that um, should be really engaging conversations. But I um, so much appreciate the both of you. Uh, Chris and May, this has been a lot of fun. And, you know, as yeah, always, likewise. it's just fun to talk with you guys. <laughs> so, it's a pleasure. So, so much. Thank you. So thank Chris. you guys. Good night, thank everyone. Thank you so much, Phil. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night.